inspiring interviews with today's top landlords. This is the Rental Income Podcast. And now, Dan Lane. My guest on the podcast today has a lot of really good information to share with us. She started buying rental properties 40 years ago, and she's still an active buyer today. She also owns a property management company where she manages over a thousand properties for other investors. So through all that experience, she has figured out the formula for buying the perfect rental property. And on the show today, she's going to share with us exactly what she's looking for when she wants to add a property to her portfolio. She's also seen a lot of investors make a lot of mistakes, and she's also going to share with us some of the big mistakes that she sees investors making with their portfolio. Joining us on the show today from Pensacola, Florida is Pam Brantley. We're going to take a really quick break. We'll thank our sponsors. We'll come right back and we'll meet Pam. It can be a real challenge to stay organized and keep track of all your rental income and expenses for tax time. Most people end up with a pile of receipts that you need to sort through and make sense of. I want to let you know about an easier way. It's a software that I use called Rental Hero. It was built specifically for rental property owners. They have a really easy to use web portal as well as an app where you can easily input all your income and expenses. You can take pictures of receipts and you're done with the paper receipts for good. They have a free 30-day trial. You can try it out. No credit card required. If you don't like it, there's nothing to cancel. Just go to rentaltrial.com. That's rentaltrial, T-R-I-A-L dot com. The first step in buying a rental property is to get pre-qualified. And I would suggest you work with a lender that specializes in working with investors because the last thing you want to have happen is to get to closing and find out the money's not there and you can't close. The lender that I recommend is Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. She's a nationwide lender, and she'll pre-qualify you for free if you mention Rental Income Podcast. Find out more today. Contact Chaley at RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E LendingGroup.com. NMLS 42056. To give everybody some perspective, why don't we start with you talking about what your rental portfolio looks like today? Um, Right now, I have... um an LLC that owns uh, six properties, and I personally have 10 properties. So okay. um, and that's a good number for me. Yeah. Did you buy all your rentals 30 or 40 years ago, or are you constantly selling off properties and picking up new ones? I'm, I, I'm always buying and selling. Okay. I don't, I don't hang on to them uh, for that long. Well, let's talk about what you have found has been been the best rentals across the the entire portfolio that that you manage and also the the properties that you own. So what do you think is a a, a good property? Like I know you said that you manage single families and small multifamilies. Is one better than the other? Um it really depends, but I would I would have to say that my experience with multifamily, the most that I've owned was 46 units and they were brick duplexes and, you know, they were all located on one street and, um, you know, they were, you know, nice duplexes and they did well for me. However, at an opportune time when the market was up in 2007, um, I sold them and made a nice profit. Um, I did find when you have two bedroom properties that you have more turnover. Um, single family homes for me has been, um, what I consider the, the best investment. And the reason for that is because if you own 10 single family homes and you get into financial difficulty or whatever, you could always sell one of them Mm -hmm. and you know, multifamily, on the other hand, if you have 46 units, you got to find somebody that's, you know, that's qualified to put money down and get a loan or, you know, whatever on, you know, a few, I think I ended up selling them for like two point something million dollars. So, you Mm -hmm. know, I mean, that's a, it's a big chunk of money. So if you, you know, depends on what bracket you're in, but for the average person that just wants to get started, you know, I think single family homes 
are great. And I like three bedroom, two bath homes. And the reason for that is because a duplex is basically valued on what you can rent it for. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's the value. The value is in the cash flow. A single family home, on the other hand, um, you know, it, it, could provide more value because not only could you sell it to another investor, but you could also sell it to somebody who wanted to live in it. And somebody who wants to live in it might be willing to pay a little bit more than an investor yep. for a property. So the value is not totally tied to how much you can rent it for. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you can, you can tweak the value by doing, you know, up, you know, if you, I'm getting ready to sell one of my properties right now because, it was that time. I mean, it's 22 years old. The roof needed to be replaced. The AC needed to be replaced. Um, tenants moved out and didn't leave it in the best condition. So I'm doing some renovations on the inside. And, you know, I was getting ready to take pictures and put it back up for rent. And I said, you know, this thing's worth double what I paid for it back in 2013. I should just sell it. Yeah. It looks beautiful. Why not? Right. So, right. you know, so I made a decision that I'm going to, it's time to sell that one. It's been seven years. That's a good amount of time for property values to have gone up and for the, uh, for me to have, you know, more equity in the property. So I'm going to sell that one and take my profit and then long term capital gains. And then I'm going to invest the money in something else. Right. The, the, the average rent here in Pensacola, Florida is is a little bit under 1200, 11 something. Um as long as you keep your properties up to standards and they look nice, they're going to rent at, you know, at the max amount of money. Um but if I'm looking at um advising somebody who's trying to buy their first investment property, I'd advise them in Pensacola, Florida to buy something probably between a hundred and 150,000. Yeah. That's a good bracket to where you can make the numbers work on a rental. You get a, if you get a mortgage, put 25% down, you should be able to rent that property for, you know, a couple hundred dollars more than, you know, your, um, your mortgage and your expenses are going to be. Now, another thing that, that is important to you when you're looking at a property is you like brick front homes. Why do you like brick front homes over other types of properties? Um, well, for one thing, if they're brick, the insurance costs are lower. But, you know, not all parts of the country have as many brick homes as we, we are lucky right. to have here in Pensacola. I don't know why, but uh, I don't really like stucco. We've had, you know, we manage a lot of properties. So I can tell you about problems with stucco, especially that kind of stucco that they put on the newer properties, which, uh, well, it was properties built around 15, 20 years ago. It was called EFAS. And, you know, that stuff cracks. It water gets behind it. It, it, it requires maintenance and your tenants aren't going to tell you when that stuff's happening. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a crack in my stucco. And so it can, you know, we only, inspect them like twice a year. Right. So the brick homes are just easier to manage or just easier to take care of, less maintenance. Right. Less yep. maintenance. Vinyl siding, you know, people will go out on their back patio and they'll light up their gas grill and they'll ruin the siding on the back mm, patio. I mean, right. it happens all the time. Yep. I've seen it yep. so many times. You know, there's just, you know, the lawnmower, the weed eater, you know, it gets eaten up around the bottom yep. and it looks bad and you know, you have to pressure wash that stuff because we, because it turns green, um, yeah. in Florida with all the humidity. So you're always having to send somebody over to pressure wash it to keep it looking decent. Yeah. Brick just is easier. Yeah. It's low maintenance. That, that's a really good point. I, I never thought of that. That is a really, mm -hmm. really good point. Now, is there a certain age of property that you find is kind of the sweet spot? I like properties built 1978 and later. Okay. Is that with lead because of lead lead paint? It, but A, because of lead-based paint and ha all the disclosure requirements the landlord has when you have an older property. You have to give them a booklet. You have to have them sign another piece of paper that's an amendment to the lease and, you know, make sure that, um, that they sign all those documents. Um, us as a real estate company, we can get audited on that and get big time fines. 
So we have to be really careful about that. But also, and I'm not sure if this is a regional thing or if this is something that I, it's, it's something that we've had anyway. Um, and it has to do with aluminum wiring and the insurance companies don't like to insure houses that have aluminum wiring. So basically if the property was built between the ages of about 65 and 75, now that's just a general guideline because it could extend a little, it could be a little earlier and a little later. Mm-hmm. But, um, but most of the ones that I've been seeing have been between 65 and 75. And if the wiring's never been updated, it's got aluminum wiring. And, you know, there's, it either has to be remediated, uh, which has cost one amount of money. And, and then there's still only certain insurance companies for an, for our investment that people will. Um, so aluminum wiring is kind of a stigma. So you really just, bite the bullet and rewire right. the house. Is aluminum wiring, is that the same as knob and tube? No, okay. knob and tube is before aluminum. Okay. That was like back in the really old houses. Yeah. And we have those too. But um, that stuff, There, I don't, you know, most of those houses have had to have upgrades because most of those houses were built back before they were even having central heat and air and yeah. you know so they don't ha- they didn't have the um 200 amp service and stuff like that so most of them have had to have been rewired by now but not you know you still have you still see it every now and then yeah it's, but- it's surprising but they did have that back i guess that was probably back in the 30s and 40s that's a really maybe. good thing to be aware of because like that it, that's going to be a major problem if you can't get insurance on the right. property or if you have to do an upgrade after you buy that property. So that's right. um that that's a really good thing to be aware of. So what do you think is is the best type of neighborhood to target? I mean, obviously if you look at the really nice neighborhoods, the 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 cash flow numbers aren't usually going to work in those neighborhoods and if you look at the low end neighborhoods like the D class neighborhoods you you've really got to know what you're doing in those neighborhoods. So that really leaves like the B and the C neighborhoods as kind of the target. Is there a preference? Would you rather buy a property in a B neighborhood or a C neighborhood? I'd rather buy a, have a B neighborhood myself, but depending upon the deal and what the numbers look like, I would consider a C neighborhood. Mm-hmm. It, the, I think the people have problems when they refuse to do maintenance and you know some of the properties start to look tired like we have a few that we manage and and you try to convince the owner to take the flowered wallpaper out of that master bathroom because it looks horrible or to you know the vinyl floor in the kitchen is 25 years old and it's got dings all over it and you know you can't even keep it clean you know but if they don't it's not actually broke, but it's outdated. Right. And, you know, sometimes you just have to spend a little bit of money in order to get a little bit higher rent. So you will notice then that there are some properties that are, say, 1,500 square foot, two car garage, you know, that may rent for $1,000 a month. And then there's others that may rent for 1250 uh, 1300, 1350. And the reason for that is a neighborhood and B, what does it look like? Does mm-hmm. it still look like it was 1978 or does it, you know, and it's got the wallpaper and the, you know, the appliances are old and it's got paneling in the family room or, or has it been updated to more the way people like to see things now? So is it almost fair to say that if you're going to buy a C-class property, you're, you're going to make it almost up to B-class standards? Like you're going to fix it Probably, up? You're gonna, I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Okay. I don't like to, you know, it's it's not just about the cash flow. It's about long-term planning and, you know... For people that maybe just can afford to buy one or two properties, okay, if they've got a couple of kids and over, you know, if over 15 years they can keep those properties and get equity and build up equity and maybe even get them paid off and then it's time for their kids to go to college, well, maybe the kids don't have to get student loans. They can sell a house and, 
and help them pay for their tuition. I mean, there's a lot of things that, you know, or planning for your retirement, things like that. Right. You know? I mean, cash, what does cash do for you? It does nothing. Right. I have cash in the bank right now because I'm trying to build a house. I hate having cash in oh, the bank, I but it. I don't want to yeah. buy anything right now because I've got this construction loan that's closing next month. And so I'm sort of on on hold. Is there anything that investors can do to maybe spend a little bit more money up front, but maybe have that save them money down the road because maybe the materials are lasting longer? You know, carpet is cheap, but it it's, you know, I mean, we pay $14, $15 a square foot for cheap carpet these days. So if you have a thousand square foot house, it's going to cost you about $1,500 to use like carpet and cheap vinyl. That stuff after about three to five years can be ruined because if you get tenants that are not cleaning it and vacuuming and taking care of it and, and it gets Kool-Aid stains and different things like that, it will be difficult to re-rent with that same carpet. Right, right. Smokers, you know, I mean, there's a lot of diff- pets, you name it. Carpet is just bad. Um, and, and when I first bought properties, I would put in cheap carpet and vinyl and get them rented. And then I found out oh, five years later, I'm having to spend this money again. But there are products now that you can buy. Um, I like the, the uh, luxury vinyl plank and they make a glue down in that, that it has a pretty good wear layer that seems to do very well. And it's, it's less expensive. Um, I can get that for a fairly reasonable price. It's about twice the cost of carpet, but it's going to last probably four to- three, four times right. longer than the carpet would. So, so in the long run, it's better. Plus, it's people like it better. People don't like carpet anymore. I, yeah. you know, it's, I mean, you have to deal with it when you're a renter, if that's what's available. But if there's a house available that has like the wood look tile is nice in living rooms too. It may not go throughout the whole house, but you know, and if you want to, if you want to do something, carpet in the bedrooms tends to last longer. So you can maybe split up the house and do the living area in, in tile or vinyl plank or, or I don't use laminate because I found that doesn't wear that well either. Um, you know, the AC sometimes can, or a toilet, um, or something that causes a water problem and the water gets underneath that laminate right. and it's ruined. So, um, and some of it, that cheap stuff, it just doesn't have a good, a good record of wear either. But I like the luxury vinyl plank and the tile. Now, let me ask you about some mistakes that, that investors make. One thing that you were telling me about before we started recording here is that a lot of times when an investor is buying a property, they will call you after they already have a property under contract. And you think that's a mistake, right? Yes. You have to be aware because there's a lot of really new people out there that are hungry and that are looking for commissions. And most agents are just to make a sale. If they have somebody who's, who calls them up and is interested in a property that they have listed, they want to sell it. They'll put that thing under contract. But the listing agent's probably not the best person to go to right. if you're a buyer. You should have your own agent who can advise you, especially these people that they don't even they're like in California or somewhere and they just want to buy a cheap property and they have no idea what they're doing. And they've got some new agent who doesn't know beans about how much it would rent for. And so then they, they put a property under contract and then they call a property management company like us to find out how much rent they could get. Does that sound backwards to you? Yeah, it, it really does. It, it, and the other thing too is the listing agent or, even an inexperienced realtor isn't going to maybe know, Hey, yeah, this is maybe a nice house, but it's not in the best neighborhood. You're going to have a lot of problems finding tenants where you've got that on the boots knowledge to know, Hey, you know, if you maybe go a few blocks away, you're going to pay a little bit more, but you're going to get a much higher quality tenant. It's going to be a better experience. So I I guess Mm -hmm. like the realtor is just getting that one-time commission and they're done where 
it's going to be your problem if if you're dealing exactly. with a, a property. So it, it's mm-hmm. kind of your incentive to to make sure that the investor is making a, a good purchase. So right. so would you say if somebody is looking to invest in a new town that maybe they should talk to a property manager first before they talk to a realtor? Um, yes. Okay. And sometimes that property manager is, you know, usually they're also a realtor right. that can advise them. If anybody is looking to invest in Pensacola or if you already have properties in Pensacola and you're looking for a new property manager, definitely reach out to Pam. I think she would be a great resource for you and she can definitely help you out. I'll put her contact information on the website. Pam has also written a book. It's called The Real Estate Rule Book, where she talks more about her story and her rules for investing in rental properties. If you want to check it out, I'll also put a link to the book on the website. You can find it all at rentalincomepodcast.com slash episode 252. I'd like to thank today's sponsor for making this episode possible. It's Chaley Ridge from Ridge Lending Group. If you're looking to buy a rental property, whether you're just getting started and looking to buy your very first rental or you want to add to your portfolio, the lender that I recommend is Chaley Ridge. She's a nationwide lender and she specializes in helping investors buy rental properties. That's all she does. She's got a ton of different loan programs, and they're all designed for investors. Whatever your goal is, whether it's a certain number of properties you want to buy or a certain cash flow number, Chaley can help you put together a plan to help you get to where you want to be. If you want to set up a time to talk to Chaley, just go to RidgeLendingGroup.com. That's R-I-D-G-E, LendingGroup.com. If you mention Rental Income Podcast, she will waive all the pre-qualification fees. NMLS 42056. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. If this is your first time here, make sure you subscribe. We put out new interviews every single Tuesday. And if you subscribe, you'll get notified as soon as they come out. My name is Dan Lane, and this has been the Rental Income Podcast.